One second. All right. I'll just I'll just explain uh, in the meantime. Okay. Uh, two bags. What's up? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, all right. Bye. All right, everybody. So we're live, I think, after some technical difficulties. Um, so the original plan for tonight was to debate a virus denier. Uh, someone who doesn't think viruses exist or cause disease. But that didn't happen. That person ended up running away. Um, they did not want oh. to debate us. So Can you hear me? Am I coming through on that end too, Dr. Wilson? I think so. Um, yep. <laughs> not, that a person not only didn't want to debate us, but attempted to do some pretty shady moves, including blackmailing, you know, doxing, um, as as per per usual, but we don't let that stop science, right? So they're too cowardly to join us, to be honest. Um, but we thought it would be nice to still hang out, talk about virus deniers, why they're wrong, and interact with you guys. So. Um, Sent Strand here had a presentation prepared for our virus denying friend, um, who again ran away if you're just joining. Uh, so he can go through that and then we'll just talk about virus deniers. So if you're ready, hey. Sent Strand, you can take it away. Thanks. Um, first off, just want to thank everybody for coming on, uh, supporting me. Um, everyone who was in the threads earlier that we were talking about who were concerned uh, about me and my family for what was going on, but everything's fine, and I appreciate everybody's, uh, everybody's support on that. My name is Dr. Thomas Baldwin. I am a plant pathologist. Um, I, some people have asked why I go by Senstrand, and it's not because I don't want people to know who I am. It's because I just want virus-denying, vaccine-denying uh, stuff not to interfere with my science. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we live in a dichotomy world where <laughs> if you are supporting uh, science on one end and talking to the public and you're engaging with people who may not be um, so keen on listening to it or hearing it, the scientific community doesn't want to be weighed down or bothered by that or they don't want that to interfere with their, uh, with their activities. But I think that scientists should go out of their way to talk to the public and talk to the um, the community and people who are not um, on board with viruses being real or the world being a sphere uh, and uh, uh, anti-vaxxers in, in order to bring them into the fold, bring their ideas into the light and show why that is not in fact the case. So I set up this little presentation and thanks Dr. Wilson for having me on. Um, we were supposed to talk about uh, do viruses exist? And the answer is emphatically, yes, viruses exist. Uh, the proof uh, in that is undeniable. The effects of viruses have on humanity throughout our entire existence are notable and undeniable. And our understanding in science, like in other aspects, have evolved our capacity to deal with these terrible diseases that are caused by it, but then also understand how viruses function in, in nature, um, as a part of nature, as, as a microbe that we, that we know. Uh, and so let's just start out with a quick um, introduction. Uh, if we want to know, uh, do viruses exist? We have to know what viruses are. So viruses are simple acellular entities that are quite diverse. Um, you can see the list of virus that I have over here on the left is a very small virus and its genome contains five proteins. Those five proteins allow it to uh, infect hosts, a wide range of mammal, uh, mammals, uh, and uh, essentially take over uh, their body, evade their immune system, and uh, grow and divide and, and spread. Um, and the other end of the spectrum, on the larger end of the spectrum, we have mimiviruses. They're called mimiviruses because they mimic microbes. They were, when they were first found, uh, researchers thought they were actually bacteria. These giant viruses uh, really bend 
the rules of what we know about bi viruses. Um, they are large in diameter. This one is about uh, 200 micro micrometers in size. Um, like I said, the size of a bacterium or larger and contain genomes that are quite large. Uh, so on the one hand, we have five uh, genes uh, encoding for proteins. Giant viruses have a thousand, over a thousand genes. Um, these are widespread in the oceans. These are widespread in our environment. And for the most part, viruses um, in the non-million types and species that are out there, um, they only interact with their selected host. So just a quick overview of what viruses are. You have an envelope uh, protein, an envelope in some viruses, a viral genome, uh, what we call a nucleated capsid, which, can, which is a protein that can, and contains the uh, nucleotides inside. They contain one or more DNA or RNA molecules, not both. Uh, and they, they're enclosed in the uh, coat protein. Sometimes there's additional lipid layers or carbohydrate layers. Uh, so all viruses have nucleic capsids and they come into very diverse ranges and shapes. Nucle nucleic acids are surrounded by the protein um, and they come in different sizes, shapes. And uh, so icosahedrals are one of them. That's the adenovirus right here, which is, I think, if you play D&D, right? 20-sided die. Um, helical viruses, such as tobacco mosaic virus, uh, and other complex uh, forms. Uh, bacteriophage is another complex form that has a very unique shape to it that is pretty iconic. Um, reminds a lot of people of um, an alien spaceship landing. Bacteriophages, of course, being viruses that infect bacteria. Viruses can be single-stranded or double-stranded, uh, DNA or RNA. Uh, and here are some examples of DNA and RNA viruses uh, that can either be have linear DNA or circular DNA. And some viruses can even switch, just in case you can't see at the bottom. Uh, parovirus, uh, screen there, come on, or don't. Uh, parovirus is a single-stranded uh, DNA virus that's linear. Herpes virus is a double-stranded DNA virus. Uh, M13 is a um, circular uh, double-stranded virus. TMV, tobacco mosaic virus, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, is an RNA virus that's single-stranded. And uh, hepatitis D virus is a RNA virus that's a single-stranded circular virus. So they can come in all of these different types and, and uh, phases. Oh, there we go. So, but what makes viruses all they're all very distinct. They come from evolutionary different, different pathways, but what makes them all basically viruses is that they re reproduce only within living hosts, which makes them obligate intracellular parasites. Viruses are, are cultured by inoculating live hosts and cell, uh, and cell cultures that way, and then their purification depends on the size of the virus and their relatedness to the, uh, the host cell components. And here we can see uh, different hosts that are that are getting invaded and parasitized by these viruses. On the left, we have SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is getting um, uh, reproduced in different cells. And on the right, we have uh, the a, a TE image of uh, a phagocyte that's infecting a bacterium. Um, a note that it's still an intracellular parasite because the um, nucleocapsid stays outside of the bacterium and then it is injected inside the bacterium, where it is then grown and reproduced uh, uh, for the next generation of viruses. So what about the history of uh, viruses and humanity? The history of viruses and humanity is quite in-depth. If there is written um, text from any aspect of humanity, they mention diseases that are caused by viruses. In this, we have a Mesopotamian text, which in fact is a law that states that if your dog is rabid and they bite somebody, then you have to pay a fine. If that person dies, then you have to pay even a, an even greater fine. So specifically, the rabies virus has been known uh, throughout humanity um, in Mesopotamia, uh, Iran, um, uh, Greece, 
I think the most interesting one comes from this Vedic period, uh, which is 1750 to 500 BCE, so before Christ, that long ago. And what's the most interesting about this text is that they uh, described what could only be rabies, because the person suffering from the ailment is uh, suffering from a condition known as hydrophobia, which means that they are afraid of water, which is something that the virus induces. This is a very unmistakable characteristic of the disease and is, could, only be, uh, could only be caused by rabies. Uh, unfortunately, this person on the, on the right is inflicted by rabies and he's giving the symptoms that uh, include hydrophobia. Unfortunately, this person is suffering tremendously, definitely wants water, but the virus itself has taken over the neurological system of him, uh, the, their neurological system and is telling him to be afraid of water. And they're doing this to weaken the individual, to make more virus in their saliva, so that when they become rabid and they bite somebody, they pass on the virus, which is what the virus wants to do, is to grow and survive. Uh, another mention of this is in the 18th, is in the Middle Ages. Uh, this was an Arabic uh, text, and it's showing a rabid dog biting an individual who then becomes rabid themselves. Now, fortunately, going back to uh, Louis Pasteur, Louis Pasteur was one of the people to work on it, actually on his free time, developed the rabies vaccine. And this child was one of the first known survivors of rabies thanks to that vaccine, and many more since then. Here's just a quick overview of outbreaks that have happened that were paired with vaccines. The first one being smallpox. And why smallpox? Smallpox because it was at that time that uh, it was realized that uh, children and women who had associations with cowpox were immune to smallpox. So smallpox was the first, first one. Then rabies in 1885, and that was thanks to Louis, Louis Pasteur. Um, whooping cough, 18, 1814, uh, uh, 1914, 1954, we had the, uh, the flu, uh, which of course came about before in 1918, um, but we didn't have, there wasn't a vaccine for it then. 1955, polio, 1963, measles, 1967, mumps, 1969, rubella. 1952 to 2016, Zika virus, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2002 to 2021, SARS and MERS, and then of course, recently, the 2020 COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which was stemmed thanks to vaccines and specifically using the new mRNA vaccine technology. Each of these instances are different times to be time periods. These are different people. They were each treated uh, and stemmed off from uh, the use of vaccines. And this, these are all evidence that if vaccines work, then the virus and the science behind the virus must be true. So how do we know what a virus is? Uh, scientifically speaking, Dmitry uh, Ivanek 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 in 1892 uh, was the first person to be credited with finding a virus. It is my great pleasure to say he was a plant pathologist. And he found these unique uh, mosaics happening on tobacco leaves, tobacco being an important crop and tobacco mosaic virus still being a problem today. At that time, uh, germ theory was just being developed. And of course, he thought that it was probably a bacterium because he could take the infected leaves, grind it up, apply it to fresh leaves that were not infected and cause the disease again. Now, interesting enough, this is uh, Chamberlain. This was Chamberlain's. Um, this is Ch uh, Chamberlain's porcelain filter, which filters out bacteria. So Dimitri had at the time then taken his uh, sap from in the infected uh, tobacco uh, plants, ran it through the filter, and determined that hey, actually the sap is still infectious, which I'm sure blew his mind at the time because. Bacteria was known to cause, to cause disease. He expected to cause disease. He did not expect bacterial free sap to cause the disease. So th at this point he called it the living virus, the living uh, uh, fluid that causes infectiousness and disease. And at that point we knew from then on that there was something beyond bacteriums 
that cause disease. Fast forward to now, and we know exactly what causes it, and we can image it. As you can see, this is an image of tobacco mosaic virus on the left, <laughs> and here is the genome sequence of uh, TMV on the right. Um, these can only exist if we understand and know how they work and how they function and using advanced molecular tools in order to get them to do that. The TMV virus even beats out uh, the Lysa virus and it, it is only encoded by four proteins that allow it to cause disease in plants. Uh, uh, editing of this virus uh, then enables us to show how the virus is moving an infection. This is um, images that I received from my good friend Thomas, uh, and what they show are a TMV I, virus. I think the images yep. aren't showing. Oh, there we go. There you go. Yep, and these images are the virus that have an attached, what's called a green fluorescent protein, or GFP, right? So that tags the virus, and if you shine a fluorescent light on it, it will shine back as green fluorescence. Now we can see the, and track the movement of the virus. If the virus did not exist, we cannot then do this edit to put in the GFP in order to see how this works and evolves. So all of this combination of science came together in order to show you this image here of the mosaic virus infecting um, tobacco. Here's another example. What this is, is the structure of the S protein from SARS-CoV-2. Now, some people will say, this just looks like cartoons. That is because you don't understand the science that's behind it. These are models that, that show you how that functions. Yes, these models come together with protein analysis, biochemical analysis, and, and genomics in order to show how the S protein works and functions and allows the virus into the cell. What you're looking at here is an, uh, it's called a mass over spec, which is, uh, cause, which is produced by uh, mass spec analysis, where you can take the entire SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus itself, break it up into its components, like you were pulling apart a car and analyze each component individually. It would take a lot to go into this and show you exactly what each of these peaks are. And if you have not done a four-year transform, then you probably won't understand it. <laughs> but it just shows you that the reproducibility and the capacity in order to analyze each and every single component of a virus is undeniable. And then just to summarize, I think the best uh, evidence for viruses is in fact the amount of publications and the amount of work that has gone into them over the years. This is t the past 25 years of data of, of t past 25 years of science have produced over a million publications uh, in virology and in infectious disease and in veterinary science in molecular biology and microbiology and plant science, uh, on and on and on, immunology. Each of these probably involves tens if not twenties uh, researchers per publication. So imagine how many people have worked on that throughout their years. And again, here we can see the amount of research that's gone on in the past 25 years uh, in terms of publications per year, which is just going up and is in just increasing. And it's going up and increasing because these experiments all rely on the fundamentals that viruses exist, that they produce disease, and that um, they are reproducibly infective. Um, Dr. Wilson, I w wonder if you could ask, guess what the blue bars are? are those uh, COVID? Or, oh, wait, no. Those are th those are SARS research. So starting SARS in, research, uh, got it. 2003, and then and then uh, increasing yeah. up, COVID up to a explodes. huge from 20. COVID explodes. Yeah. COVID research explodes in 2020, 2021. That's 2020 and 2021, and it, it actually kind of does show that um, the SARS. SARS-CoV-2 research has taken over a, a lot of the field currently, right? And beyond the capacity, so it didn't just move that up. Yeah. But worldwide outbreak and pandemic, so you would expect such a thing. Yeah, creating okay. priority, and then also, yeah, labs. For yep. for some time, labs uh, couldn't stay open in universities um, unless they were doing work that was pertinent to the pandemic. So yeah. a lot of and then you. 
Yeah. You'll have a delay on publications too, so that's why in 2021, like it basically shut down every science except for what was working on that, because um, um, it's like delayed by at least a year, sometimes more. Yeah, one person is asking, is this compared to total research? No. This is just within infectious diseases. This is just a, yeah. Or viruses. This, this specifically. is just total total amounts. Papers per total amounts of papers per year. I don't know what the total papers per year is. Uh, I could take a look at that real quick, but it would take me a minute. Yeah. So, and just to go over some points that people who deny viruses uh, say, uh, viruses are not are not exosomes. Uh, they are not extracellular vesicles. Those are different. They utilize sometimes the same cellular mechanisms to be created, but uh, host EVs contain host proteins, host RNA, host DNA, uh, and the most important part is they cannot replicate on their own. Viruses and virus particles produce infectious virus particles that have viral particle, viral proteins, viral RNA, uh, and replicate. Uh, here's another example taking straight from our friend Kaufman, uh, showing what he says are vesicles. They will often point to these that look very similar, right? But what he's not pointing to is exosomes and then comparing it to TMV or helical viruses or any other kind of viruses, just the ones that are coronaviruses that sort of look like uh, exosomes under the microscope. But again, if you take those exosomes and you uh, inoculate them on cell culture, they do not replicate. And if you take the, co uh, the coronaviruses and you put them on cell, cult cell culture, they replicate and they cause disease. Okay. Um, another point that's often brought up is that viruses do not follow you, uh, um, Koch's postulate. This comes up over and over again. And they seem to think that Koch's postulate is some unbreakable tome that pathologists need to apply their entire existence to, which is incorrect. Uh, Koch's postulate has been modified many times. It is certainly a good start and it was the start of pathology. And it is a simple basis. So what is Koch's postulate? It's the organism must be one, the organism must be regularly associated with the disease and its characteristic lesions. The organism must be isolated from the diseased host and grown in culture. The disease must be replicated, uh, reproduced uh, with a pure culture of an organism is introduced into a healthy, susceptible host. The same organism must be re-isolated from the experimental infected host. Most of this applies to viruses. Some of it does not apply to viruses specifically grown in culture because viruses cannot grow without their obligate host. Um, so many microbes and viruses cannot be grown on media. Some cause disease. Some disease causing ones are part of the community. These are viruses, but are other organisms as well. One pathogen can cause more than one type of disease, streptococcus uh, or enogenes for, once, for instance. Many diseases lack uh, another host like HIV. Horizontal gene transfer destroys the idea that one one organism causes one disease. Some diseases like type 1 di diabetes might be due to a combination of different factors. Mm -hmm. Some diseases, uh, some disease has an infectious or non-communicable uh, origin. Uh, here is an update on what specialists look like in the 21st century, utilizing what we know now. So a nucleotide, uh, nucleic acid sequence belonging to a punitive pathogen should be present in most cases of the infected disease. Microbial uh, nucleic acids should be found preferentially uh, in those organisms or uh, gross anatomy sites known to the diseased and not to those organisms that lack the pathogen. Few or no copy numbers of the pathogen associated uh, nucleic acid sequences should occur in the host or tissues without disease, not none, as asymptomatic infection is is known to exist with the resolution of disease the copy number of the uh, pathogen associated uh, nucleic acids dna or rna sequences should uh, decrease or become undetectable uh, with clinical relapse and um, opposite should occur when the sequence detects predates the disease or sequence copy number correlates with severity of the disease or pathology 
the sequenced uh, disease associated is more likely to be a causal relationship. Right. The nature of the micro microorganism inferred from the available sequence should be consistent with the known biological characteristics of that group of organisms. Tissue sequence uh, sequence correlate should should be sought at the cellular level. Efforts should be made to demonstrate specific in situ hybridization of the microbial sequence in the area of the tissue that is pathogenic or that is being uh, that is um, showing the symptoms to visible microorganisms or to areas where the microorganisms are presumed to be located. So when they say these are EVs and we say, no, it's not, this is SARS-CoV-2, here is an in situ hybridization to show that the sequence that is uh, associated with SARS-CoV-2 is actually there in the image. These sequence, uh, the sequ these sequence based uh, forms of evidence for microbial cause should be reproducible. And at the time of Coke, uh, of uh, Coke, uh, um, there were asymptomatic carriers that. Um, so on that, um, another aspect uh, of internet is unstable. You you still got me? Oh yeah, we're you're good. Okay. Yep. Uh, another aspect that they have a problem with is is cell culture. It comes up again and again that cell culture is not reliable or somehow magically produces the virus all on its own, which it does not. Any one experiment in cell culture cannot derive another virus. Uh, and you can take any of the um, metagenomic sequencing that is done in that experiment. Um, the serial passage of uh, of viruses indicate that it is a virus and not a toxin, as they would like to say. So sometimes they will say, "What all you're dealing with is a toxin, and you're seeing toxic effects." Toxins do not replicate and reproduce. Therefore, serial passage of a toxin will only lessen the effects and not uh, allow it to reproduce. So serial passage of a virus. You still there? I think you might be cutting. Jeez. I'm sorry. I think you might might have cut out a little bit. Oh, that's okay. Keep going. Okay, so I'm on the TC50 test, which is this 96 well plate. That oh yeah, TCID50. Yeah. So yeah, TCID50s are uh, serial passage uh, 96 well plates. Now, serial dilution is different from serial passage that I said before, which might be confusing. So serial dilution means that you took the same sample and you diluted it in series um, in order to get less and less on an exponential level, right? And, and as you can see here, the less viruses that are available, the less they are able to infect the plate. And the more the, um, the, the, more the uh, cells are able to survive, uh, the dark purple is is indicating that the cells are surviving. Now, um, if if this was caused by any of the materials that are used to grow the cells itself, you wouldn't see this serial dilution effect that you see on this plate. And I'll end there. I was going to show you that uh, this is a really interesting uh, bit on evolution, but it's also quite complicated. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. So uh, eukaryotic uh, viruses actually come from prokaryotes, uh, from prokaryotic viruses, and it had evolved since then. And, and this is basically showing how, how that evolution functioned into the different groups. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. Is there um, any questions? We can, yeah, we can give a uh, time for the chat to have some specific questions. Um, I'll ask the chat. Um, if there's any, if there are any claims from virus deniers that you want to hear us talk about that might be tough for you to deal with, or you're just not sure what the right answer is, then feel free to ask. But I was just going to add, uh, if you want to go to that slide on the spike protein with the yep. EM images. Yes. <clears throat> this is something that Carl had, had given me this a little, a little bit last minute. I think it's a really good um, oh, yeah. setup. Oh yeah, the I, I love EM uh, structures. Um, 
but this is something that I always show to virus deniers. Um, and it's what we showed to Kaufman during his live stream. <laughs> um, and he, he, I don't think he knows enough to address it, but when we do get virus deniers to look at this and comment on it, they say kind of what you alluded to that. It's just pictures, uh, cartoons, but how these images are actually captured is physically, physically from samples. So an electron microscope will, uh, shoot a beam at a, at, at a, at a molecule, for example, and that electron beam is going straight through that molecule. Um, right. and the electrons are going, uh, that are going past that molecule are hitting a detector and the electrons that are hitting that molecule are bouncing off of it and then also hitting that detector. So by looking at how, uh, which spots on the d detector are registering, you can work out kind of the negative space uh, of that molecule. You can, d you can use calculus to kind of backtrack each and every electron that didn't follow a straight path that bounced off of an atom and hit a detector. And if you do that for all those electrons on that one molecule, you'll get a pretty low resolution map, honestly. Um, but then the microscope will go and do that with hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of different uh, of molecules in your sample. And so by averaging all of those measurements, that's how we get these models that show us atomic, almost atomic resolution uh, structures, sometimes actually atomic level resolution structures of proteins. So it's not just cartoons, it's not just computers generating an image, it's physically gathering data from a sample and then using calculus and analysis to determine what the structure actually was. <clears throat> and, those, so, and those structures are, are predictive in terms of what proteins are there, and those predicted proteins show up in the genome, as you would expect. Exactly. Because it's, because it's atomic level resolution, we can see the amino acid sequence in the protein. We can see where um, the methionine, is, or we can see where the beginning of the protein should be, and we can see where the end of the protein should be, and we can see everything in between. And, and, and the sequence of amino acids matches what the genome of the virus would predict. A genome that is not in the host cell genome. So the host cell genome cannot produce this protein, only a virus can. So, um, yeah, that's all I had to add to that. Um, nice. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks for putting this together, Thomas. This is great. Oh yeah, no, I was a little bit more rushed because it's the holiday season. I'm still trying to wrap up stuff in lab. I like to like formulate this into a better, you know, a more cohesive uh, piece and actually challenge somebody with it oh, at right. some point. Yeah. But, yeah, maybe one day we'll get uh, someone to. Oops. You got stuff in the chat. Yeah, do uh, you want to? If you want to stop sharing, we can. Yep. Stop sharing. Sorry, we can, we can go back to that. Um, let's see. Uh, we have people thanking you. Um, no, thanks everyone. Doing, doing a great job. Um, thanks, Environmental Coffee House. I appreciate that. Yeah, viruses are, are quite interesting. There's a lot on on uh, rabies virus that I had uh, gotten into um, uh, the Kurtzkus Act video just highlighting the overall pathway of how a virus with five proteins can hijack the entire immune system of an individual uh, cause all of these effects and and spread and, and cause that devastation it is quite interesting um, there's an audio book that's like free on on youtube if you just search it that uh it is quite interesting it goes into the, the entire history of of rabies and it's quite spread out throughout Europe and throughout European history. 
Yeah. Yeah, rabies is a big one because, I mean, any virus denier, I mean, if they're willing to put their money where their mouth is and, you know, not get a rabies vaccine after getting bitten by a rabid animal, uh, I, I seriously doubt many would actually do it. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> just, just crazy that oh. they deny deny that thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here, here's one from Cinnamon Control. Yeah, I was uh, going to read, read that report? next. Yeah. Um, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Uh, they ask, yeah, I have an acquaintance whose objection is that you should be able to just take a clinical sample and see viruses under a microscope. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible to take uh, tissue samples from a patient. Uh, this has been done for SARS-CoV-2 in post-mortem patients. Uh, they can actually take slices of the tissue, look at it under a scanning electron microscope. So this is not a kind of microscope that's going to give you atomic resolution structures. For that, you need a uh, transmission electron microscope. It's a different instrument. A scanning electron microscope is kind of going to let you just get a cursory view of the nano world. Um, and you can totally use that to see uh, viruses in patient tissue samples. Um, obviously, scanning electron microscope can't always identify exactly what kind of virus it is, but you can combine that kind of uh, experiment with biochemical analyses. So you can take that same tissue, you can stain it for um, particular proteins, specific viral proteins, you can look for specific viral nucleic acids, and you can also use a scanning electron microscope to look for the structure that you would expect. And you can actually see viruses budding out of cells um, in, in, in those cases. So yes, it's possible, and I know Tom Cowan is one of those people who says, you know, why can't you just take fluid from a patient and get and purify the virus that way. I mean, no one would want to, no one, no scientist would spend their time trying to purify virus from a patient sample. You can detect it very easily using all the methods I just explained, but if you want to purify it, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to purify it right from a patient sample because you're not going to have enough to really do anything with. You can purify it and you might be able to, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> What I usually say is that scientists do the science in order to progress things forward. They don't do the science in order to disprove people who are just denying the entire thing. And that's an example of it. It's like, well, and I call it like the duck hunt uh, conundrum. It's like, oh, I think he froze a little bit. Okay. You froze after duck like, hunt. I call it the duck hunt. It's like yeah. I don't I don't trust that you've actually caught ducks that you have in your hand because I don't like that you used a dog in order to duck hunt. <laughs> right. So yeah. you have to, but the do, the ducks are in your hand. Right. Yeah. It's it's really just um, yeah, kind of the whole scenario where flat earthers are like, well, why didn't you have three other cameras on your rocket? Well. Yeah. No one's trying to prove a, a round earth to you. People are trying to do science <clears throat> right. and get and take videos on a rocket to get people excited about science. But um, right. yeah, you can absolutely do that. It is possible. Um, yeah. And it, and the, the thing that I, I like the most is um, with the tobacco mosaic virus, you can literally grind up a couple of leaves and, do a, a direct separation because the leaves are able to produce so much more virus. So any time somebody says that, I say, okay, well, if you go to a less complicated system, which mm -hmm. is a plant system and extract virus, then you can get that exact thing, but then they don't want to hear that or deal with it. So you can never nail them down. It's like nailing water to a wall. If, um, <laughs> if all viruses exist, is it just animal viruses that don't exist? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, cinnamon uh, control, how to avian, 
uh, cinnamon right. control had a little follow-up rather than using cell culture. Yeah. So the reason you would use a cell culture would be to expand the viral, the numbers of the virus so that you can do more experiments. So if you have a s sample from a patient, you're going to have a very limited number of viruses. And yes, it'll be like, it could be on the order of millions of viral particles, but that's not enough to do much experimentation with. Um, you really want to add the virus to a cell culture, expand those numbers so that you can do things like purify it, do things like do biochemical assays, do things like mutate it. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> um, Bo Open-Minded has a question right below that. Uh, Open-Minded, do you have EM images of viruses? Oh, good job. You just got 10 bucks. Thank you, Cinema Control. I did? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Wow. I didn't know that was something you could do. <laughs> cool. I think that's my first. It's the first time anyone's done that. Thank you. I appreciate well, that. You, you don't, really you don't deserve ha that. You don't have to do that, time. but thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, there it is. Wow. Uh, uh, it just jumped in. Uh, uh, do, do you have virus image, uh, EM images of virus and their uh, complementary antibodies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are. Yes. Um, oh, let me see if I can find it. Um, there was a paper in either Science or Nature um, of spike protein bound to an antibody. It was a cryo-EM structure. Yeah. Uh, spike antibody EM oh. structure. That's right. Uh, oh, here's a, well, here's a paper of spike bound to ACE2. So spike bound to its target protein. And I will make sure you have host capacity. Oops, not that one. Um, yep. There it is in chat. They 3D print vaccines. Um, yeah, it doesn't... Well, it's uh, the mRNA is technically no, it's produced in cells. You could you could uh, DNA print a vaccine, but it would be a very expensive way to do it. I'm pretty sure they don't do it that way. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if 3D printing is. Does um. Okay. Here. Yeah. Here's the here's a preprint about structures of human antibodies bound to SARS-CoV-2 spike. Um, I'll put that in chat as well. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know you, of you, 3d printing being used in vaccine technology much. Um, no, I mean, you'd have to, if you could print at the atomic level, yeah, <laughs> protein I, level. But. I think when I think of 3d printing and vaccines, the only thing I think of is this idea that's been out there for a while. And I don't know if it'll ever really take off, but this idea of using micro needle patches to administer vaccines. Mm -hmm. So right now we use mostly needles and syringes, but mm -hmm. there's this idea of using a patch that has these micro needles on it. And at the tip of the micro needles are, um, you could load, <clears throat> you could load virus, you could load vaccine. Um, and the idea is to, Attenuated virus. What's that? Uh, you said you could load a virus, but I'm assuming you mean attenuated virus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember um, a colleague in graduate school um, using it to administer um, um, they were viruses that were going to deliver genes, gene constructs to mice. So um, they were using it for that, but you could also use it for vaccine administration. Um, and I, in that idea, you could theoretically load multiple different vaccines into a single micro needle patch. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. But anyway, the 3D printing part is I think those micro needle patches can be 3D printed. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to get the Nate the Great here. He's been asking about the influenza uh, outbreak in uh, in birds recently, and is it a shock to us? I don't think it's a shock. Uh, I know it's a big problem. Yeah, it's affecting <clears throat> different different bird species, and it's affecting the poultry industry. Right, that's problematic. But what else do you mean by that, Nate? No, uh, cases of influenza spreading is not is not new. Yeah, I, I don't know if this year is particularly bad for yeah. bird flu. It's um, super bad. It's bad for bird flu this year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's not surprising, and I think there have been other bad years for bird flu. Um. Mm. But yeah, it, it's the one that viral virologists worry about a lot um but to put it in context um it's it's a it's a really dangerous influenza virus super deadly but it doesn't spread very well between humans <clears throat> uh and as far as we know it's never really sustained transmission uh between humans um and from what I understand, the barrier for it to do that is pretty big. Right. Uh, but we should not underestimate viruses. Uh, it's okay. definitely possible that it oh, could. It's, uh, and, and I know because I'm uh, integrated into the agricultural community that it's a, it's a problem. They, it, it crops up all the time. Oh, but yeah. what, what, do you mean anything by it, Nate? Do you just mean that it's it's a it's a problem that we need to take a look at, or are you trying to get at something else? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, yeah. While, while he answers that, I would say, um, it, it's definitely the big one that a lot of virologists worry about. I mean, that's right. that's if if bird flu. Yeah, it does suck that we yeah. have to call birds. I mean, that's that's really a shame. Um, but a lot of the birds are in the poultry industry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's it, but it's it's still a shame. Um, but uh, if a bird flu strain were able to retain its deadliness, so to speak, and be able to sustain human to human transmission, which Again, mm -hmm. it, it, that that's that's kind of a big question. Would it actually be able to do that? Would it be able to transmit from human to human and and remain as deadly as it is? Uh, we don't really know, but if it did, that would be like that would be like civilization ending uh, potentially. Uh, if we if we weren't able to deal with it quickly, that would be really really bad i mean 60 yeah. percent fatality um regardless yeah. of regardless of age that's that's mind-bogglingly terrible uh scenario scenario to imagine um uh, it's uh, almost instances of virus yeah it's um, almost like um uh, oh yes yes there yeah. is there's a famous Absolutely. example of that um the rouse sarcoma virus Right. Um, so yeah, just to re just to read the question again, any are there any instances of viruses acquiring host DNA and RNA fragments so that a previous slash original host can be identified? Yeah. Um, so the famous example is the Rouse sarcoma virus. It's a virus that infected chickens. Um, and Peyton, uh, I think he was a chicken farmer and a virologist named Peyton Rouse, mm. noticed that. Um, his chickens had these tumors and I don't remember all the details of the stories, even though I've heard it in like four different classes I've taken, but essentially the, the gist is that this virus, um, causes cancer in these chickens because it picked up a bit of 
a proto oncogene, so a, right. uh, a gene that could cause cancer in its host. It picked that up because it, uh, in its life cycle, it integrates into the host genome, and that, and when it comes back out, there's a chance for it to pick something up. And the fragment that it stole um, made it so that the protein would become oncogenic. It would become cancer causing. So yeah, viruses do that all the time, and that's that's a famous example of it. Uh, and evolution, evolutionary biologists can also uh, be informed by things like that. They can track viruses through host evolution and kind of get an idea of how the host evolved. Right. Um. How the, and the, how the virus evolved to the host mm -hmm. as well. Is uh, that, was that a, do you know if that's a retrovirus? Is that more likely to occur in viruses that insert themselves into genomes? I, I believe so. TSE prions in deer and similar wildlife infect people who eat them, yes. Prions are, are very difficult to treat. Oh, I think he, is he asking about the chronic wasting disease prions mm -hmm. in deer? Mm, yeah, I don't they, know. If... They infect people who eat them, but you have to. You have the, the thing with deer is that they are in the nervous system, so uh, you have to be really careful not to um, not to eat anything from the nervous system mm. yeah, or I... any organs. Yeah, I, I don't do that anyway for deer. Right, it's a it's a big deal in the cattle industry as well. Um, I don't know if chronic wasting disease has been known to affect humans yet, but prion diseases can take uh, decades to manifest. Yeah. So we we don't really know yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Slow moving. I think there were a couple other uh, questions up above. Um, where was it? So we're in the, the overreaction to this virus is going to cause the next reaction to be under kill. I don't know. How do you feel about SARS and what that's um, about COVID and what's that's, what, what that's going to do for us for the next one. Oh, you mean, um, are we better prepared? Is that a question? Are we, are we better? I think institutes are better prepared. I think people are either better prepared or, or the opposite. <laughs> I, I hope so, but I don't, I don't know if I'm as optimistic. Um, I just don't know. I don't. I don't know if um, world governments are investing enough into prevention of the next pandemic, let alone preparing to deal with it when it ha when it comes up. What you should. What you showed earlier in a tweet, uh, which is sad, is the discrepancy between countries and getting vaccines. Oh yeah, yeah. The vaccine equity issue. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, vaccines just weren't shared uh, equitably across the world, and it really cost lives. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how well prepared we are for the next pandemic, or if this if this really taught us anything. I hope it did, <laughs> but I mean, we still have people in Congress who are saying that it's too dangerous to go out and sample animals for viruses like come on how are we supposed to learn what's out there then are we just going to be sitting ducks like, yeah it, it just it's it's crazy i think that debate needs to be had um i can understand like if there are lax laboratory conditions but that's not great Sure. But at the same yeah. time, most people are trained, and then they know what to do. What if if there's a if there's an incident? So, but people are people. So, 
Yeah. It's not that it shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, of course, talking now about the origin of COVID, but at the same time, there's, you know, there's a lot involved in terms of, um, uh, country dynamics and mm -hmm. yeah, politics. That's too much yeah. out of the scientific realm. Yeah. <clears throat> Currently, the, um, the most, the, it's, you know, the way that I see it is the laboratory that has the least safety procedures, uh, the greatest incidence of spillover is just your outdoors. Oh, yeah. It's just nature itself. Yeah. Um, someone up above a little bit asks, did Africa get the COVID vaccine? Um, African, certain African countries did get um, lots of the, I mean, lot as in like a manufacturing lot, like not, not, they got a bunch, but they got certain shipments of COVID vaccines, but not yeah. much, not much. Uh, the rest of the world kind of bought up most of the available vaccines, um, and did not really distribute them or share them with a lot of African nations, which it's frustrating for me because I every time I see this, like, what about Africa thing in this oh, COVID, yeah. COVID vaccine debate, it, there are just so many things involved there. I mean, first of all, African people do want, do generally want COVID vaccines. Um, I, I have family in Southern Africa, um, specifically in Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Uh, they know infectious disease there. I mean, they're no strangers to it. They suffer from HIV AIDS. They suffer from yeah. sleeping sickness, malaria. They know, they know what oh, infectious wow. disease can do and they want solutions. So if they had COVID vaccines available, they would definitely get them. Um, but they don't, unfortunately. And most African nations, don't have great surveillance. South Africa does have good COVID testing surveillance, but lots of African nations don't. Uh, so we're not really getting an accurate picture of how many cases or how many deaths there are because not only do they do a lot of African nations not report accurate COVID information because they can't, but they don't also, they also don't report excess death figures. Right. Uh, so all I can mind about it, I've also, I, I've asked my colleagues from Africa, you know, why they didn't suffer some of the surges. And their answer to me was they, they are used to pandemics mm -hmm. and they know like to keep distance and to, um, to do hygienic things, to wear masks and, and yes. cause they have to deal with that more often. Yes. The, the behavior is, is a big part too. Um, I mean, South Africa closed its borders for a very long time. Yep. Um, my, my dad went to visit family in Swaziland and he had to present a negative PCR test before he got on the plane, um, present the information when he got off the plane and then stay in South Africa for, I think it was a week before going into Eswatini and he had to do the same thing coming back. So it, lots of regulations there. And in Ghana, um, you could be jailed. You could serve jail time for not wearing right. a mask. So, um, yeah, they're obviously taking it seriously. So, I mean, take, takes, take an anti-masker crying about having to wear a mask indoors in America and see how long they last in a country that knows infectious disease is a problem. One of the things that I didn't bring up during the talk that I want to talk about um, is uh, is Lanka. Oh, Stefan he, Lanka, yeah. Stefan Lanka. He came out with unpublished, unpublishable uh, stuff that he just puts on his website. And um, I was really distraught by the, you know, what he did was he had like this four setup experiment and uh, Frank uh, Visser is, is the best one that like tracks all of that. Uh, he just had 
plates of cells that he starved, which didn't look like which didn't look like uh, CPE at all, right? And said that they were, and then said at the end that he did an RNA extraction to do uh, metatranscriptomic data, and then said he could develop SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes from that, which he obviously cannot, it's not possible. But then the next uh, series that he had, he said, uh, he went and did a overview of the original SARS-CoV-2 paper. And what I see Virus and I are saying is like, look, he was able to analyze the um, sh shoddy uh, cell culture experiments, and he he was able to find the SARS-CoV-2 genome in that. And I have to explain to them that no, he didn't. He just reanalyzed the original SARS-CoV-2 genome paper, uh, and in that paper, he found the SARS-CoV-2 genome, proving that the virus exists and is there. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's wild to me, like thinking that you can create any virus you want from any genome. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, he just so kind of, yeah. Yeah. So when I was with you during the um, Cowan and Kaufman uh, charade, that was their webinar. And I had the chance to go in one or two directions. And I, I definitely went the cryo EM route because it had three you know, independent sites of evidence just in one figure of what it is. But the thing that bothered me the most was how he was saying that um, you can make anything out of genomics and mm. you absolutely cannot. No. <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if that were the case, then forensic laboratories would just no. not work, not work in court. <laughs> we not wouldn't have any genomes, uh, and I wanted to show a I wanted to show a genome view. Uh, let me see if I got. Go ahead and uh, talk. I'll see if I got time. Um, I can pull it up real quick. Oh. Um, sorry, what do you want me to talk about? I don't have anything for you. No, no. Oh, I didn't. It didn't upload. Anyway, I, I just wanted to show. You know the 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 hundreds of thousands if not millions of uh of 300 base pair fragments that overlap in order to create a genome assembly oh right yeah the right yeah, <clears throat> yeah. i don't i don't know if people really understand like how powerful that is because each of those genome assembly each of those fragments that are run through the illumina because it's next generation illumina um the machine doesn't care what is sequenced out of that it sequences whatever is there Mm -hmm. Right, and it's three hundred base pairs. So, uh, so having those overlaps of hundreds of thousands of fragments at three hundred base pairs is is extraordinary uh, evidence of a genome. Yeah, yeah. Um, We're I think, probably. I think I saw someone talking to the. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, I think I saw someone mention in chat, and I uh, got a direct message just now, <clears throat> asking about that new died suddenly documentary oh um, yeah I saw that. it's it's garbage i i mean i i saw trailers i haven't watched the whole thing yet but yeah it's stupid um i think uh the real truther on twitter has done a real good job of going through that um there's a in the trailer there's a video of a basketball player collapsing uh -huh. on the court um, that happened in, it was either 2019 or 2020. It was before vaccine, COVID vaccines were rolled out. Um, and he collapsed and he, I don't remember what the exact reason was, but it happens. You know, athletes are pushing themselves all the time. Right. So, sometimes they have dehydration or just exhaustion and they need medical attention. This basketball player was just named like player, player of the year or something, mm -hmm. something like that. But he he's he's still alive. He's great. He's he's doing really well in his in his uh, career. He didn't die. And this died suddenly documentary is doing things like that, just using Why? people uh, who either had a medical incident or genuinely died suddenly and just correlating it to vaccines it's right it's 
It's what anti-vaxxers have done for over a century. Just take any medical uh, bad thing that happens and say it's because of vaccines with no evidence. Yeah. You remember, I think, earlier in 2021 when uh, I was talking to you and what what was going around was the cardiac incidents on soccer players. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is like just point to the, well, there's more cardiac incidents on soccer on soccer players than there ever was before and i think you know i I couldn't figure out how to show this this data but the thing was is there was more games than there ever was before right so there's more instances to to have those cardiac events yeah so but on average there's no been no increase right there's no increase i mean and and i shared with you there was like a PSA from 2014 about sudden cardiac arrest in athletes because like I said athletes push themselves they kind of are pushing their bodies to extremes in some cases and so if someone has a uh, undiagnosed heart condition or if they just push themselves too hard they can bad things can happen and so it's been a known phenomenon in the sports industry for a long time. There's, there are PSAs about it, trying to inform people and know the signs and how to prevent it and stuff like that. Um, it's not new, uh, but anti-vaxxers just learn about something new and then they attribute it to vaccines. It's ridiculous. Um, You address debunk pleomorphism. A lot of virus and germ theory deniers say that the reason we see microbe, uh, microbes in tissue is because they come from our cells, uh, like nerves or heart tissue. No, because they are not encoded in our genomes. Yeah, They are made up of entirely different uh, components. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. The- yeah. No ma- if you grow human cells in a dish for an eternity they'll never produce um, something that is not encoded in their genome. They can't produce a bacteria, they can't produce a virus, unless it gets in from the environment. Um, Yeah, they're just biologically very different. Um, I think uh, Environmental Coffee House asked earlier, uh, weren't countries recently at the G20 talking about responses to future pandemics, etc.? Probably. I don't know. But world leaders have talked about pandemics before. Um, because they disrupt everything. It yeah. makes life hard for them. Yes, it makes hard life hard for the billionaires, too. Um, until they take advantage of it, of course. But um, I... They're probably talking about pandemics, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if they're really taking action. You know, I don't know if they're really implementing actionable plans, uh, should something happen. Um, I really just worry that during the next pandemic, it's going to be the same scramble and same mistakes made again. Um, yeah, but so there will probably be another one within our lifetime, so we'll see. Uh, so, I mean, I guess just a comment on anti, uh, antiviral, you know, antiviral. <laughs> I wish they were antiviral people. No, people are just virus deniers. <laughs> this is, you know, this person that we were supposed to have a debate with, I could show you the, I could show you the talk that I had with them, and I went on for a really long time. Uh, yeah. And yeah. After the thousandth time of repeating myself, I say, oh, well, you're never going to get it. I get frustrated. And then suddenly, you know, the little bit of frustration is used as the cudgel to say, well, you don't, you can't hold a civil, you know, civil conversation. Is, Is that, it seems like that's just a tact, right? I mean, do you run into that a lot? Um... Most of the time, virus deniers aren't concerned about being civil. So he, I think he was kind of unique there. Um, I think he was really just using it as an excuse to um, to Dang. not to not come on with us. 
Um, swear, swear all you like. I don't think I, at at this time of the hour, I don't think we have kids on this program. Yeah, you can swear in chat, and people swear on stream. It doesn't matter to me. Just be respectful for people. Well, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I I think he's just making excuses. Yeah. Uh. So for more context, he was demanding that we apologize to him for being mean. Uh, before he comes on camera and debates us. And meanwhile, he is just being very vile, uh, really just <laughs> yeah, an awful person. Really and so I'm like, no, I'm not going to say sorry to you. You don't deserve it. However, you can come on camera with us and we can have a civil conversation. And he's like, right. no, he's like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then, right. And then when that didn't work, he went way off into the extreme. Right. Yeah, but at least his doxed stuff was removed fairly yeah. quickly. Yeah, that was good. The help of a lot of people. So if he's watching, he's probably not learning anything. Yep. Um, I just don't know what else to say there because there's. Um, all of the areas that I talked about and all of the different uh, different viruses I mentioned involve different people. So it's not like a cabal of some scientists could get together and make the thing up, right? Because mm -hmm. it involves everyone. It involves people who would rather viruses not exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, in medicine or agriculture, right, doctors or uh, farmers don't care if viruses exist they care that viruses cause problems right. and once you understand that then if you you put the treatment towards towards those either in a vaccine or a pesticide that got rid of the insect that was carrying the virus then the problem goes away because you understood the biology of how it works mm -hmm. and yeah. that's just something that virus scenarios will never get to yeah another thing uh, you reminded me um, when I was an undergraduate, one of the summers, um, that I had off of college, um, I worked an internship on this team. We were surveying for a plum pox virus. So, um, it was a job where essentially what we did was we went out to an orchard, um, surveyed a bunch of orchards within the surrounding county, uh, counties and, um, picked leaves, took those leaves back to the lab, processed them, and then did an ELISA to look for viral proteins in it. Right. Uh, and this is a plum pox virus. It's a virus that infects stone fruit trees. So like cherries, peaches, things like that. Um, and we're looking for this virus and it's so bad. It's so bad for these crops oh, that yeah. If we find if we if we were to have found a positive sample and confirmed it with PCR and everything, then that farmer would torch their whole or, whole orchard. Yeah, because they, they don't want it. They don't want it around. It just decimates their crop. Yep. So uh, thankfully, we never found it. Um, we went a whole summer without finding it, and I'm pretty sure they never. That program still has not found plum pox virus they've successfully gotten rid of it um but yeah i mean the viruses are real to industry they care about it and it causes problems when you ignore it um and yeah. oh oh one thing i wanted to kind of say before we get too late is um so we're talking about virus deniers and to most people it's pretty obvious that viruses exist. Um, it's something that any biologist would kind of just shake their head at, laugh at it and think that's stupid. It's utterly yeah. ridiculous. Why would, why would anyone believe that? Um, but I think it's important to talk about these things because we don't want a scenario where it's, oh, those are fringe, crazy people over there. Let's just ignore them. And then suddenly, you know, 10 years down the road, you have a virus denier 
in, elected in, in Congress. Yeah, I mean that kind of that's happened with fringe conspiracy theories before that were laughed at and thought there's no way that that that's going to take off. Um, QAnon. So, what's that? QAnon. Oh yeah, QAnon. Yeah, I mean. I'm pretty sure that like 10 years ago a th- a thing like QAnon would be pretty most people would agree like okay that's ridiculous that's never going to be a mainstream idea but then there are plenty of people in US Congress right now who were QAnon believers um I mean if you ignore it it's if you ignore um a bubble like that the bubble is has room to grow yeah but if you kind of come in and start poking at that bubble maybe at maybe you can stop it from growing um but i wouldn't expect to like pop it entirely Uh, but it's important to engage on these ideas even though they're crazy and just to kind of drive that home let me check a particular YouTube channel here to see how how they're doing or maybe oh yeah they're still on YouTube um, last week I god sorry I didn't mean to play her voice uh, yeah a virus denier on YouTube has 320,000 subscribers so uh. how long until that <laughs> idea becomes one that is held yeah. by someone who's making legislative decisions for you. Um, I hope never. So that's why I think it's <laughs> worth talking about these things. Uh, so. Uh, I don't know what else we can do because it's like the lie can travel around the world so much faster than the truth, right? Can yeah. follow. Yeah. And that just seems to be the point like with most scientists is it's they can say a claim that's very succinct and there are no viruses. And then I have to spend, you know, they could say that in seconds and it would take me 20 minutes in order to show all the reasons why that is. Right, right. Right. Yeah, it I think scientists a part of the problem is that the conspiracy side is very organized and this is like what they do you know people like Kaufman Cowan they make their money off of this it's what they do and for scientists it has to be like a side Side. thing like I don't make my living off YouTube nowhere close Uh, not possible uh, for me so um, there's some people who are really good at it yeah, some people uh, some people do. Um, we do, <laughs> but uh, you know it's really tough to do that. So most of the time, scientists would have to do, make it like a side thing, so they can't dedicate much time to it. Um, it's usually like a kind of a grassroots thing, like me popping up on my own or another scientist somewhere else deciding that they want to do a podcast or whatever. You know. Yeah there's no there's no organized like coalition of science communication that is going to uh address these things um there are some there there are some groups um that will make statements about things sometimes but i my my kind of perspective is is just that it's it's too scattered relative to the conspiracy people who are very well organized and very well funded have you did you know i I showed you that uh submission for the national academy of sciences engineering and math yeah i haven't gotten a chance to read that yet i've been i i know some of the members of that committee I, i would like for you to you know definitely submit on that or consider submitting on that i i definitely will um yeah, I just have to dedicate the time to it. Uh, it it's tough. I, I mean, it's hard. Like, it's, there's a lot of things. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like even what was it? I think it was last month. I 
did a talk for a um, um, vaccine advocacy group out in I- um, Iowa uh, called Iowa Immunizes. And I got put in touch with some great um, vaccine advocates in, you know, a little bit closer to where I live. But getting in touch with them and keeping in touch has just been slow. It's been hard because we're both busy. Um, we're all scientists who have regular day jobs and then we do um, this advocacy or communication stuff on the side. So it's tough to really get organized about it. Um, so hopefully in the future there's going to be more good funding for science communication efforts and hopefully there will be more um, good science journalists because I really think that's that's a key. Scientists can't do it on their own. Good science journalists yeah. have to be involved in this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to find those people now. Yeah. Because you, you have to have skills in both both worlds of, of being able to understand the science and being able to communicate that effectively. Right. Yeah. There are some people who are really good at it, but I don't think there are enough of them. Mm-hmm. And definitely not enough of them who are spending a lot of time directly addressing misinformation or disinformation. Um, this is an interesting question. How many other viruses have spike proteins and approximately what is the ratio between the number of spike proteins that are cells manufactured from mRNA and full blown infection in its peak? Oh yeah. Good question. Um, I don't really know if I have exact numbers on, on those. It depends on where you're cutting, you know, do you mean viruses in a specific clade or? I have a paper in mind. Let's see if I can find it. Um, But how many viruses have spike proteins? Um, The coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are... Yeah, coronaviruses have spike proteins, um, and that's the only virus that I know of that have proteins called spike. Right. Um, the others have receptors. Yeah. Um, where's my history on this computer? Here we go. Okay, let's see if I can go back. Hmm. In general, I would say that uh, the amount of of because you, you're not just when when you're infected, you're not just exposed to the virus to the spike. You're exposed to the entire virus, right? And those take over your cells and cause damage. Uh, I know that the amount of mRNA that is introduced is a hundred uh, micrograms in one of the doses. Yeah, that's from Moderna and Pfizer it's 30. Um, but then, uh, yeah, so in an infection, you're definitely going to have more, um, than in a vaccine. Um, in terms of numbers, if I can find this paper, I can give you a better idea. Uh, I'm looking through my history right now because I don't remember the name of it, but I remember a specific figure. Um, but the gist is essentially that there's a lot more virus per, and a lot more spike in you during an infection than in a vaccine because in a vaccine, you're getting one dose of mRNA. The mRNA cannot replicate. Whereas, uh, oh, and, and, and it mostly stays uh, localized to your arm, uh, to your muscle. Um, Whereas a virus, it's going to be able to replicate. uh, And, oh, here it is. It's going to be able to replicate and uh, it's going to colonize multiple different uh, parts of your body. So it's going to be in your nasopharynx, it's going to be in, it, it could be in your lungs. Yep. Um, if it gets bad, it goes deeper into your lungs. Uh, it can be 
detected in your blood. Uh, so taking all of those things into account, uh, it's, it's, it's much more than vaccine. And here is the paper. There you go. Oh, perfect. Nice. So that'll give you a better idea. That was the thing I was talking to Frank before, and he wanted to go over the meta transcriptomic data. And he was kind of, I, I guess it was confusing to him or he was upset. He was like, Hey, if you look at the meta transcriptome, um, the bulk of the things that are there are not SARS. And I think that's what people who are saying like, you know, Hey, why is there not that much SARS in it? Don't understand that a small amount of the actual bulk of MRNA is enough to cause the issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, out of the entire metatranscriptome of SARS-CoV-2, the MRNA only makes up like 0.01%. You can find things in the metagenome. In fact, I think I have that. I might show you how it is yeah. and walk, walk you through it. It's like, yeah. you know, just uh, mites that might be also inha inhibited, you know, inhabiting your lungs make up a bigger proportion of the actual mRNA that's there by, uh, ma by magnitudes. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of things in there, right? You know, because human beings are not sterile creatures. Your lungs have... Uh, bacteria, microbes, um, fungi, right. uh, mites, and uh, that are that are there uh, that don't cause any harm because the air right. we breathe is not sterile. Right. Yeah. Your body just knows. Your body just has a way of dealing with it. But then, if that balance gets thrown out, um, out of whack, then that's when things get get bad. Right. Because the the organism actually there is causing actual harm and damage, which is, is, you know, demonstrated. Um, and then when they, when you do the alignment and you actually say, what's the biggest chunk of the genome that's there, it's the, it's, um, it's the SARS-CoV-2 genome because it's the longest genome that's, that's there because everything else is not a mRNA organism. Oh, no way. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> I, I went to um, Sam Bailey's YouTube channel. And she has a video from three months ago called "What About Rabies?" I haven't watched it. Oh God! Gotta gotta add that to a list. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm very curious what she, what kind of garbage she'll say about that. Um, Anyway, sorry, I totally just de oh, derailed fine. what you were saying. <laughs> I, I was done with it. I was okay. Uh, it, it, it was just saying that I think people are surprised at how little amounts of virus can cause um, can cause problems. So then, when you're, right. when you're saying it's like zero zero percent, zero zero one percent of the entire uh, uh, metatranscriptome. Uh, is this actual thing that's causing the disease. And then that's why they just expect it to be just the dominant thing that's in there. But only, but a, a small amount of actual virus is, is needed to, ca to cause the actual. Yeah. The Rel actual disease. Right. Relatively small. Mm, relatively. Mm. Right. Uh, 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 Kusfori says a few years ago, a neighbor took part in a marathon who just recovered from the flu. The poor guy died with a heart attack while racing. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. I mean, I know people, um, I have a very, very good friend who, um, lost someone very suddenly in their sleep. Um, that was several years ago f before COVID the person who passed away was, not even 60. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, these things do happen and for anti-vaxxers to just hijack them and say that it's a new phenomenon because of vaccines is just, it's privileged because it means it hasn't happened to you or anyone, you know, and it's also just gross and ignorant. So, 
Oh yeah, Potholer fifty four is awesome. Oh yeah, Potholer is great. He had some stuff on uh, COVID too. He did. He yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, he he drops a video like very rarely, but uh, they're all I, I always enjoy them. I, I I'll stop what I'm doing just to watch those, yeah. those videos. He's got great videos. Yeah, he takes his time to do it too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. So these people like Kaufman and Cowan and Bailey, they they wall themselves off pretty good. They do. Yeah, they're they're not open to talking to people who uh, would critique them, except for people like uh, Joseph Mercola. For some reason, they wanted to have a debate with the anti-vaxxers who do believe in viruses. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was just for clout. Like, they thought that they could access that anti-vaccine oh, yeah. crowd and get more followers. <clears throat> Whereas they know that if they go up against um, actual virologists, actual scientists, they have nothing to gain from that. No, oh, they'll fall. They'll fall right apart. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, they they're pretty isolated. <clears throat> it seems but, like. They've probably developed their own immune response now to our crashing their system. Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried to because they don't take after after that they don't take they don't take questions really live anymore. Nope. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a couple that's hilarious. of I joined as you know a couple of times after that as different people and they don't take any questions. They will read questions sometimes, but mm-hmm. it's all well prepared ahead of time. I see. That's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, we'll just have to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. With Sam Bailey and just you know break apart of your <clears throat> video. She's just wrong, and, and I can only imagine straight up lying at this point. Yeah. Maybe I'll maybe I'll make another video about Sam Bailey. We'll see. My current plan is to. I need to just. I need to get on with it. I need to just film for my next video. I still haven't done it, but I've done most of the prep work and it's going to be on um, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s appearance on Dr. Drew's show, mm-hmm. which was terrible. It was oh, awful. no, that's not. Yeah, that was that was that was terrible. Oh, you, you checked that out. <clears throat> I, I saw parts of it. I didn't get it all done. I am. Looks like I'm going to have to head out soon. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm gonna have to but end it soon. There was a there was well. I was laughing because there was some comment that says, "Did you get uh, are you gonna get Z Dog on the channel?" On this channel, I don't think so. <laughs> no. Who, no. Who? What was that? Um, the guy that had the uh, debate set up the debate with um, Graham. Graham. Oh, oh, uh, Brent Brent Lee. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Hopefully that maybe that'll work i can't believe he got a debate with um with we'll have to come back on and talk about that debate did with, you see that debate with, with graham and cahill yeah i i yeah. tuned in for the i tuned in for the last like 20 minutes of it or so um that <laughs> i i t- i started listening in and i'm like who is this who, who, who is this person talking and then i realized oh it's cahill what yes how did, how did she know. show up <laughs> what yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Dolores, Dolores Cahill is a, she's wackadoo. Right, right. <clears throat> uh, he did such a good job on that. Everybody should go watch that debate or listen to that debate. I think it's on YouTube. It is, yes. Yep. Um, but yeah. All right. uh, well, I'm going to have to head out. Um, it was really great talking to you, Dr. Wilson. Yep, Keep I've got to. Thank Enjoy you. Thank you. Enjoy that 10 bucks you owned it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. And thank you again for that. I, you didn't have to do that, <laughs> um, re- but I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, Thomas, thank you for joining me and uh, uh, putting together that presentation. Uh, cool. I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I, I also have to get up early in the morning to start smoking a turkey. Um, oh, me too. So uh, I am going to 
head out and uh, good night everyone yes everyone take care happy thanksgiving happy thanksgiving to all and to non-americans um happy thursday (laughs) happy thursday (laughs) and eat eat food eat lots of food all right okay see you next time